morning. Great to see you here this evening. Let's go ahead and stand if you're able to. We're going to start off, we're going to sing, Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. Lift it up here on that first verse now. Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. start things off. Now we're going to sing uh, The Love of God. We we sang this probably a few months ago, and uh, there was actually quite a few that didn't know this song. If you know this song, raise your hand. All right, all right, we got a decent amount. All right, make sure you sing it out now. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes
singing, you can be seated. Just want to give you a couple reminders. We are, we've got our missions conference moved for July 5th through the 8th, and our camp has been, been scheduled, rescheduled for July 20th through the 24th. If you're interested in going to camp, make sure you let us know so we can get an accurate count and get that into the camp here in time. I'm going to go ahead and pray, ask the Lord's blessing, and then we'll go ahead and receive the offering tonight. Thank you again, Lord, for the day. Thank you for uh, the surgery that Scott Crawford was able to have, the way you were able to put your hand of help upon him. And Lord, just thank you for the recovery that he's getting. I pray you'd continue to give him what he needs here during this time of help and strength. And, and Lord, thank you for the progress that Miss Connie has been able to make as well. Would you just please put your hand of strength and help upon her? I pray that you would bless the offering. I pray you bless the gift and the giver. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Let's go ahead and stand one more time now, if you're able to. We're going to sing Nothing Between My Soul and the Savior. Love this song. Let's lift it up here on this first verse now. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Not a Thank you. 
good singing, you can be seated. Well, let's grab our Bibles and turn over to 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18. First Kings chapter number 18, and we will begin reading here in verse number 9. First Kings chapter 18 and verse number 9. We'll start actually in verse number, verse number 7. This is where we left off here this morning. First Kings chapter 18, verse number 7. We looked at a man named Obadiah, the this man who is overlooked, and it might even be that we read this and wonder why he responded how he did. I want to try to explain this passage of Scripture to you here tonight. This man, Obadiah, is a great, great, great character. He is a good person to look to and to study, and the more that I've looked into his life, the more things I've found. And so let's go ahead and start reading First Kings chapter 18, if you'll stand, <clears throat> beginning in verse number 7. First Kings 18, verse number Seven. It says, And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face, and said, Art thou that my lord Elijah? And he answered, I am. Go tell thy lord. <clears throat> behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned, that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom, whether my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said, He is not here, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, Go, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Elijah went to meet uh, and Ahab went, went to meet Elijah. Thank you so much for standing for the reading of God's word. You can be seated. Let's go ahead and pray. We'll get right into the message. Thank you again, Lord, for the day. Thank you for the chance to be here. Lord, we're so thankful to be able to open the Bible, so thankful to be able to gather together. And it's such a joy to be able to be here in your house. I pray that you would use the time that we have. I pray that you would speak to our hearts, and Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to live in such a way that those who come behind us uh, can, can benefit from that which we've done. And God, I pray your hand of help upon us here, and Lord, would you just use the time we have, I pray that when it's all said and done, that the decisions that we make would make a difference for eternity. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. If you want to, um, you can turn over to Psalm 127 or just put a little marker over there. We'll, uh, we'll turn there in just a moment, Psalm 127 as well. And in our text, we get introduced to a man named Obadiah. This is the only reference, if, you, if the name Obadiah rings a bell to you, it might be because there's a minor prophet named Obadiah. This is not that Obadiah. This is a man who is the governor of the house of King Ahab. And King Ahab is a wicked king. And if you want to try to make excuses for King Ahab, you certainly can make no excuses for his wife, Jezebel, who was a very, very wicked woman. In fact, her name is become a synonym with an evil woman. I mean, you'll probably never meet a Jezebel in your life. And, and probably... If you want to get on the bad side of a woman, call her a Jezebel, all right? I mean, his wife was the, and, and maybe just don't do it, all right? Actually, uh, just don't do it is really what I'm trying to say. I don't really know why you'd want to get on the bad side of a woman, but, but it's a quick way to do it if you say, what is that Jezebel doing? I mean, it's just, a, it's a word that is a synonym with evil and rebellion. And so these two uh, together, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, 
had a reign of idolatry and rebellion against the Lord. And God used the prophet Elijah to interact with them on several different occasions. And so we meet the man who is the governor of the house, a man who holds a very prestigious title, a man who has great influence named Obadiah. And I think it's very clear that Obadiah fears the Lord and he loves God. He's had a long, I don't believe it was a secret that he feared the Lord uh, because we're going to see it was a testimony that he had had for quite some time. And you might wonder why a king who is a pagan king would have a righteous man. And if you look in the Bible, you'll find pretty often this happens. Uh, There are people who don't fear the Lord, but they like the effects of having people around that fear the Lord. You remember when Joseph came into Potiphar's house? He noticed everything Potiphar did, just God blessed it. And so he figured out, you know, I I ought to promote him. And it wasn't that Potiphar was a God-fearing man. He just knew that this man feared the Lord and he could be trusted and he was honest. And the same thing happened when Daniel was brought into the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, etc. They saw that the hand of God was on him and they liked the effects of having somebody who fears the Lord. Even men who are not honest want somebody who's honest to, uh, to oversee their things. And so, and so we see this man named Obadiah who, who, is, uh, who, who God used him in a special way because at some point Jezebel decides <clears throat> to... She thinks we can rid the land of the famine. The famine lasts three and a half years. She thinks we can rid the land of famine. I know what we can, need to do. We need to get rid of the prophets of God. And so she starts rounding them up to have them killed. Interestingly enough, she was onto the right idea, but the completely wrong application. The famine ends when the false prophets get killed. But the famine's surely not going to end when the uh, prophets of God were being killed. And by the way, it's interesting that if you look at this grievous famine that affected the land, you can study about the contrasting life of Judah during this time, and they don't experience, they aren't experiencing any such famine. It's just Israel that's experiencing it. But again, people will always look for a reason that justifies what they already think. And so she, uh, she did not want to serve the Lord. She hated the servants of God. So she decided to round up the prophets and have them killed. Obadiah, rather than round up the prophets and kill them, took 100 prophets and hid 50 in one cave, 50 in another cave, and he fed them with bread and water. And so he kept them alive. And, uh, and rather than turn them into Jezebel to be killed, he spared them and kept them alive. Now, Obadiah has been with the king for quite a bit. He's been with the king as the king has searched high and low to try to find Elijah. And here he is now going with the king on a mission to try to find any water where there's any grass and land that the animals can live. And they're trying to save what animals they have left because they know they'll starve to death. Uh, and they'll die of dehydration if they don't find water. And so he says, you'll go one way, I'll go the other. We're going to seek out wherever there's water, wherever there's a stream, wherever there's a fountain, and we've got to find some water to try to save some of the livestock. And so while they're doing that, Obadiah goes his way, Ahab goes his way, and as Obadiah is walking, the number one most wanted man in Israel is standing right in front of him, the prophet Elijah. And he recognized them. He says, art thou my Lord Elijah? And he says, I am. Uh, And verse number uh, 8, he says, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. Now, pause for just a second. You would think, even if he doesn't want Elijah to be found, this would be, for his career, really nice. You would think he'd be... At the very least, he would be only upset. I don't want to tell him you're here because then he's going to have you killed. But that's not it. He's actually really upset when he meets Elijah. And Elijah says, I want you to go back to Ahab and tell him that I'm here and I want to talk to him and that you have found me. And so verse number 9, he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation nor kingdom whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not here, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, go, tell thy Lord. Behold, Elijah is here. This is so funny if you read the story. Here he is looking for him. He comes upon Elijah. He says, I can't believe it. It's Elijah. You're here. It's you. He says, I'm here. Go tell Ahab you found me. He said, 
What, what did I do to deserve this? Can you believe, you want me to go tell him Elijah's here. I know how this is going to go. He says, here's what you don't know. I've been with him as he's gone from nation to nation to nation. So uh, he said, I went with him to the king of Moab. I could see you as a Moabite king. You kind of remind me of the Moabite kings from uh, the Sight and Sound Theater, actually. You know, I think if you just grew the beard a little more, you'd be a, a, a dead ringer. And he went to the Moabite king. He says, have you seen Elijah? Is he here? Are you hiding him out? No. no. You, you, you're going to swear to me. Swear to me that if you find him, you'll tell me. You swear to me? And he made him swear. He says, all right, I swear. He goes over here to the Amorite king. Not nearly as intimidating as the Moabite king. He goes to the Amorite king. He says, hey, have you found Elijah? Will you look for him? He says, I'll look. Wait. No, he's not here. He goes, you got to swear. If you find him, you tell me. We've got to find this guy. He's going to kill me. Will you swear? Will you swear to do it if you find him? All right, good. He makes the deal. And then he'd go down to the next king, the king of the Hittites over here. Yeah, well, he's definitely a Hittite king. And he'd say, have you found, uh, have you found uh, Elijah? Search out the land. He sends out the spies. Search out the land. Have you found him? No, I found him. you you got to swear if you find him, you're going to tell me. Swear it? All right, good. Then he goes over here. I haven't decided really. I mean, he needs to be king of the giants of some kind. Maybe the Philistines. Yeah, okay, the Philistines. Because he's probably, the, are you six foot four? Six foot three. Is there anybody in here taller than him? Who? No, I don't think so. No, I think it's you. So you're, you're, you're Goliath for our intents and purposes, all right? And so, so he went to the king of the Philistines. He says, is Elijah here? No, he's not here. you got to swear to me. And he made him swear an oath to every place he went. He traveled in person. He said, I have to find this man. This is the most important thing. He says, you find him. You ha Look, if, you, if I find out you're harboring him, oh, the consequences are going to be huge. I mean, he had watched this happen. So why is he now so scared that he gets to be the one who says, I have found Elijah. Uh, I want to just point out, if you're taking notes, the hesitation of, of Obadiah. He's got this hesitation. You want me to go tell Ahab? Why in the world? This is going to kill me if I tell Ahab. Now, uh, what, what is the fear that he has, all right? Fear is based on two things, and you see it in our text. Fear is based on what you know. He had seen how badly the king wanted to get Elijah himself. He had experienced the lengths that Ahab had gone. He wa it wasn't just enough for him to say, you'll let me know if you find him. The Bible says that he took an oath out of every place that he went, and he scoured the land to find him. The Moabites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Philistines, all of the ites in the Bible. I mean, he went to all of them, and he made them all swear, and he himself searched for him, and he tried to find him, and could not. And by the way, whenever somebody would have a report that they thought they'd spotted him, you know, they'd sent people to go and to find him. And he, he said, I know how bad the king wants to find you. And so fear is based on what you know. He knew that. But fear is also based on what you don't know. The fear of the unknown is really far greater fear than fear of the known for us. Uh, even, for example, the more we've learned about this virus, truthfully, the less scary it's become. I'm not saying that it's not a threat, but the more things you learn about it, the more you find out where you are danger, uh, where you are danger, or where you're not in danger, where it is susceptible and where it's not susceptible. And uh, there was a time I was going and uh, running outside in the same little walking trail where other people walking, and I thought, I mean, I'm breathing the same air other people are breathing, but you know, as long as we've been living on the earth, we've been doing that. And then come to find out that's a pretty safe thing. The more you know, it's pretty helpful. It's the things you don't know. And so he says, I know what's going to happen. I know the king wants to find you. And when I leave here and I go to Ahab, now I want to try to illustrate it here if I can. And this may help. I hope it will. So oh man, I don't want to scare James off. Just kind of do like this with your thumb if you want to help me or not. Did you just say no? You'll do it? Did you say you'll do it? All right, get up here, James. I gave you a, a subtle way, and I would have found an excuse to make you not look bad or anything. All right. You're going to be Elijah. All right? I need you to be fleet of foot for me, okay, when the time comes. And then um, I need you to be Ahab, all right? Come on up here, Jeremiah. And Josiah, can you be, can you be uh, Obadiah? Because your name sounds pretty similar, all right? Josiah, Obadiah. Here we go. All right? So we got, we got Ahab over here, right? You're Ahab? 
And we got Elijah over here. We got Obadiah. Obadiah is, uh, they've had their little powwow. He says, look, you go that way, I'll go this way. They, they break their ways. And, and, and while he's searching, behold, boom, here's Elijah. He says, I want you to go and tell the king. Now, we're going to pretend he's a little further away. All right, we're just like the big map picture here. All right, uh, you're going to go and tell the king that you found me. And it, the key is, he says, tell him that, behold, I'm here, if you go back and read it. Behold, tell him I'm here. So you know where I am, tell him to come to where I am is what he's saying, all right? Now, why is he afraid to do that? Because in his mind, this is what's going to happen. He's going to go back and tell the king, and the king, you're going to be all hot and mad. You're going to, come on, do that. Raise your hands around. Oh, you, he wants to find Elijah, and yeah, he says, I found Elijah. Oh, I can't wait to get my hands on that rotten Elijah. And so you're going to go take him, but now you go just dash to the other room, hide behind a pew or something. Perfect, just like that. It's good. Oh, there we go. Okay, so then you go bring him back. Go bring him back. Point to where he is. Point to where he is. Show him where he is. And you know what the king's going to do? What do you think you're going to do when you see he's not there? Yeah, this is exactly right. The sinister look in his eyes. If only he was facing you. Just imagine that he's got death in his eyes. It's kind of scary. So, so here we go. If he knows, he's going to look to him and say, you told me you found him. Now, why would he be upset if Elijah, look, he says, look, Elijah, he was here. I promise he was here. Why would the king be upset? Anybody? Because he wants to find him real bad. Because what? Thinks he might have lied. All right. Think like a king. The most wanted man in Israel. That guy, right? Pop back up for a second. The most wanted man in Israel. Somebody comes to you and says, I found him. Quick, you got to come see. And you go and he's not there. What are you going to say? Yes! Why didn't you grab the guy? Why didn't you? Oh, I know you're the most wanted man. Could you just wait for a second and we'll be right back? No wonder he was in fear of his life because he thought, I know what's going to happen. Now, come back over here for a second. You go back over here for a second. Back to your spot as king. You're searching for, uh, for grass. You're looking for water. It's tough business. Here's what he was afraid of. Not that Elijah himself was going to run away. The text says he was afraid that the Spirit of God was going to pick him up and carry him away. Can anybody think of a time that that ever happened in the Bible? Who said that? Elijah? When? Yes, right with the whirlwind, right? That happened at the end of his life. So has that happened? Yes. Okay. Can anybody else think of a time that that's happened? Enoch? Okay. And, and what we know about Enoch is that he walked with God and he was not, for God just took him. So again, took him and now he's gone. Anybody else think of another time? Maybe New Testament. Philip? Well, Philip, maybe you call him Philippi, I guess, if you're technical, maybe. But, but Philip, um, Philippi is a place. Philip uh, <clears throat> went to go, and the Spirit of the Lord carried him up to the Ethiopian eunuch, and then he baptized him, and then he carries him away somewhere else. Has that happened yet? No. So best we know from the Bible, how many times has that happened? Zero. Zero. One of two things is a possibility here. One... He was thinking God's going to just do something he's never done before. And he's going to whisk him away to keep him alive. Or what I think is more likely, remember when he was at the brook Cherith, and he then travels to the pagan land of Zarephath? If the king's got everybody looking for him, does Elijah seem like a ninja to you? I've never gotten ninja vibes when I've read about Elijah. He's more of a, I'm here. You know, he just announces it to everybody. I think that it is possible that people saw him and sent this king to go get him. They knew he was there, and the Spirit of God picked him up and moved him. He said, I don't think so. Okay, we can agree to disagree. But it's pretty strange that he's afraid this is going to happen if he hadn't seen something like this happen with his own eyes while he was with the king searching everywhere to find him. And so he says, I don't know how you made it out of our hands alive last time. We went down to the brook. I saw your camp. 
and I followed your tracks, and then they just disappeared. I mean, God picked you up and moved you. He says, I know what's going to happen. You're going to just vanish and disappear. Thanks for your help. You did a great job, especially the disappearing. You did a great job with that. All right? Thanks, guys. You can be seated. So why was he upset? He was upset because he says, something's going to happen that I don't know, and God's going to protect you, and then it's going to fall back on me because I'm not supposed to go and report that I found you and you want to meet with them. I should arrest you and detain you and bring you to him as a captive and a prisoner, and you're telling me to go and to seek the Lord. And so here he is in, in verse, number, verse number 11. Read it here. And now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. Now keep reading. So, and he, he says, as soon as I go, the Spirit of God's going to move you, and then he's going to kill me. Verse number 13, was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with water, bread and water? Here it is again. And now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. He says, I can't believe you want me to go and tell him you're here. You don't, you don't want to come with me. You want to wait here, and you want me to bring the king to you. Oh, he says, I'm going to get killed if I do this. All right? His hesitation had some basis in reality. It looks to me like God probably brought him out of the brook and brought him to the place supernaturally, and God had providentially protected him in a miraculous and wonderful way, and he knew it and feared the Lord and said, this is going to happen all over again, but in this case, I'll have seen you and known you were there and brought, and, and I'll get in trouble because I didn't arrest you and just capture you right then and there. So he says, what did I do to deserve this? What, what is my sin? He said, didn't you hear about how I've spared the prophets and I hid them by 50 in the cave when Jezebel wanted to hide them and I brought them bread and I brought them water? And then he says here in verse number 13, at the end of it, or I'm sorry, uh, verse number 12, there it is. And it shall come to pass that as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. All right, we see his hesitation. He doesn't really want to go, and he doesn't really want to tell Ahab to come and meet Elijah. He'd be okay to bring him to him. He'd be okay to pretend he never saw him, but he really doesn't want to go and bring him because he just is afraid something is going to go wrong. But, of course, he does it. He does it. And if you'll notice here in verse number 15, he does it after he hears this. As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. When he hears this, as much as God is alive, I'm going to do it. He said, okay, if you'll wait here, I'll go and get the king, and I'll be back. And, of course, he does. All right? You've seen his hesitation. Why was he able to overcome the hesitation? I make the case to you it's because of the history that he had. In verse number 12, after he says, the, the Ahab's going to slay me, when, I, when he can't find you, but he will be able to find me, and he's going to kill me. He says, but I, thy servant, fear the Lord. Everybody say those three words, the last three words of verse number 12. I, thy servant, fear the Lord. From my youth. All right, very good. From my youth. Now, if you study Israel and Judah, you're going to find this. When the kingdom splintered under Solomon, or Rehoboam, rather, uh, when the kingdom splintered underneath Rehoboam and they divided the northern and the southern kingdom, Judah sometimes had good kings, sometimes had bad kings. Israel always had bad kings. If you want to talk about not a great place to be raised, it would be in the nation of Israel after they had separated from Judah. It was just a time of idolatry and paganism and judgment again and again and again. But that doesn't mean there weren't some people who feared the Lord. We've got some people like a guy named Obadiah who had parents who raised him and taught him to fear God and serve God, and he learned it from a youth. This is pretty incredible. 
this guy who, it was an act of faith for him to leave Elijah and to go and get the king and bring him there because he didn't know if Elijah was going to be supernaturally protected by God and his life would be left as forfeit or he would have to forfeit his life because of it. He didn't know that, but he was willing to trust the Lord for really the two things that we see here because he already feared the Lord himself and he had learned to fear God since he was a child. There's an expression that says, as the twig is bent, so the trees incline. You notice, because we've got the wind, seems like it's always coming out of the south around here, like always. The trees have a bend to them. Whenever, whenever they're windward and they're actually exposed and not hidden behind a windbreak, the trees just have, they've got a bend to them. And so to combat that, you'll see when people are planting trees, they'll stake them off. And they'll stake them off and they'll put tension on them to try to hold them in place because if not, if they keep growing as saplings, then they're going to be really crooked when they grow, become full-grown trees. The idea is that the direction that a, a young tree grows gets established permanently as it gets bigger and bigger. And you can correct a sapling while it's small, but once a tree is mature and established, it is what it is and it isn't going to be changed. And, and what I'm saying is that one of the greatest gifts and greatest opportunities that we have is a chance to have an influence on young people, whether they be your own children or just simply children in general. And here is somebody who lived in a wicked time. He worked for a wicked king. He knew what it was to fear God. And you wonder, how could he keep his eyes on the Lord in such a crazy place? Because when he was a child, he was taught what was true and what was right. And the lessons that were ingrained in him as a child manifest themselves and showed themselves again and again. That's why Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. The idea is that if you'll instill these things early and you'll help to bend the right way early, then it makes a difference and it establishes things for later on. I'm saying one of the greatest things you can do is to live in such a way that we are teaching and showing the kids of our church and the kids that live around us what is true and what is right because here's somebody who learned some lessons as a child that held on to them as an adult. I remember as a young boy learning how to lead somebody to Christ and memorizing the Romans Road. I think I was about eight years old when I took my first time, took somebody through the entire plan of salvation, and they bowed their head and trusted Christ as Savior. It was incredible. I was eight years old. I had just done that and been taught to do it, and so I was doing it. And I had been taught that as a child. There went a period of time where I, uh, as a teenager, uh, we, I just wasn't really very active in soul winning, telling people about the Lord. And one day I was at work, and I worked with a guy who was Korean. And him and I had hit it off, and we got to talking. And uh, he was waiting. He had got off work, and he was waiting for his ride to pick him up. And he had just said some things throughout the day. You could tell that a lot was on his mind. And so I asked him, I said, Lee, what, what's going on? He said, oh, I've just had a lot on my mind. And so I finished work, and I sat down next to him, and I started talking to him. And it became real apparent real quick that Lee was lost, and Lee needed to be saved. And he was under real conviction. And so uh, I didn't have a Bible with me at the time. I was at work and probably should have, but I didn't have one on me at the time. I didn't have one in my car or anything. And this was before the age of smartphones. It's a nice time, a cell phoneless time. When your car broke down, you just had to ask somebody else to help you. Uh, you know, anyway, it was, it was a different time. And, uh, and so I said, I said to him, look, Lee, I, I don't have a Bible. I'll write these verses down for you, but I'm going to quote them to you. I know the verses. I learned the verses when I was a kid. And I sat across from Lee. I answered his questions. In about 30 minutes, after quoting the Romans road to him, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5.8, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I sat down with Lee after about 30 minutes. He bowed his head and he trusted Christ 
Christ as a Savior, and he got saved. It was pretty incredible. I was excited about it. But that happened not because of anything I did, but because of something my parents did. They brought me to go soul winning and tell people about the Lord when I was just a kid. They, they made sure that when our church had soul winning times, we were there. They made sure that when we were learning the Romans Road, I learned it. And I'm saying that there were things they put in me as a kid that helped me out later and that still continue to help me out to this day. Obadiah stood before, uh, before Elijah and he said, why would you ask me to do this? This is going to cost me my life. And he says, on the word of God, as the Lord liveth, I'll do it. And he said, you know what? I fear the Lord from my youth, and I'll fear the Lord now. And the guy who has this incredible testimony didn't, isn't somebody who got saved later in life. He's somebody that learned it from a child. You see, he'd been fearing God since the time he was a youth. He had parents who taught him that there is nothing in this world greater than the fear of the Lord. There is nothing in this world more important than the worship of the Lord God. And so when he lived in a time that was pagan and that was wild and that was crazy, he knew how to navigate the time because since he was a child, he had been taught those things. My hope is that the people that grow up at Calvary Baptist Church never have to wonder if the Bible is the word of God. Because, because we have believed it and known it and said it and practiced it and taught it and example, lived a life that exemplified it and memorized it and encouraged them to know it. My prayer is that they would know that, that they would be able to say, since I was a kid, I've known that. I remember learning that in junior church or in Sunday school. I remember hearing that as early as I can go back and remember. There are things that if we'll teach them to people when they're young, they'll pay dividends to them as they get older. And the Bible doesn't make a promise that every kid who learns right will never stray. I mean, all we have to do is look around and even look in the Bible and see this. Uh, but there's the general principle, which is what Proverbs is. It's General principle, for example, uh, when the Bible says that, uh, that the first commandment with promise is honor the Lord uh, and uh, children obey your parents and Lord for this is right, honor thy father and thy mother that it may be well with thee that thy days may be long upon the earth. Well, there are some times that God takes a child home, but that's the exception, not the rule. In general, God adds to the life of those who honor their parents. And it's also the general rule that the people who are raised and trained in what's right, when they're old, they don't depart from it. I've seen kids who were raised in Christian homes that didn't turn out right, but I've seen a whole lot of them have the foundation to build on even when their heart did get away from the Lord so they could get back right. It is so much easier when you have a foundation and when somebody has taught you these things and it's not a struggle for you. It's so, I was thinking during the, uh, the offering this morning, I saw Kendon put his offering in Conrad's hand, I think. And he walked with Conrad up to the offering, and Conrad gave. <laughs> and he's three? He's three. He's a well-dressed three-year-old. How in the world did you get matching shirts? Is this like the Internet or a store? Okay, the store. I'm impressed. All right. And, uh, and he's teaching him as a three. I mean, could you imagine that? Anybody who, who tithes knows it's not easy to tithe. Can I tell you what it's easier, though? when you get taught to do it since you were a kid. Anybody who hasn't gone to church faithfully knows it's a challenge and a struggle. But you know what's a lot easier? When you got raised doing it. It's incredibly easy when you can go back and say, from a youth, I have known this. And I was talking with, I was talking with someone uh, today after service, and we were talking a little bit about kids, and, and uh, he was just telling me that he wasn't sure if he wanted to have kids, and so I asked, well, why not? And he said, because it scares me to think about bringing a child into this world, the world that we live in. So, you know, I, I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. Um, this guy lived in a pretty bad world, but he had parents who raised him in such a way that he could be a light in that world. And I am firmly convinced that one of the greatest hopes of our country is found in Psalms. Let's go ahead and turn over there for a moment. Chapter 127, Psalm 127. Verse number three, Psalm 127 and verse number three.
it says, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Real quick pause, and let me just say this. Um, one, of the, one of the things before I got married that I had to come to grips with, I, I was always glad to have children and everything else. I was always hopeful that that day would come and that I'd be able to be a dad and all the rest. My wife, before she was married, she, she was wanting to have like a lot of children, you know, like Duggar-type numbers, right? Okay. And so, um, so I had to come to, to terms with either she would change or I would change, you know. That was going to be a problem because uh, I, I wasn't thinking like a tour bus, you know. I was thinking more like a Suburban. That was, you know, my thought. And so, and so I studied it out and talked to people and I sought the Lord and I talked with somebody who holds a different view about children than I do. Uh, about them and all the rest of it. Um, but he gave me a book to read, so I read this book, and he pointed out this verse, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And I remember that in the book it said this, in our society, children are viewed as a burden. But in the Bible, children are called a blessing. And I remember thinking, I think that's how I view children, as a burden. That, that was really how I viewed them. I thought, you know, you don't get to go out on as many dates. They take your money. You know, they do. They cost money. Hopefully they don't steal your money. But, but they cost money, and, and it takes the time. And, you know, I've heard from some guys, they say, oh, you know, there's hardly any more romance now that we have children and all that. And so I had all those fears in my mind uh, about having children. And I thought... Well, you know, yeah, I mean, children will be good eventually, someday, but not anytime soon. And when I saw that verse, I had to realize that the Bible teaches differently about children than what our culture teaches. And I had to really just humble and repent before God and get my own heart in align with him and say, God, you say children are a blessing, and so I'm going to agree with you. Children are a blessing. The Bible says the fruit of the womb is his reward. Could you imagine, think about this, could you imagine, here you are having a conversation, Brother Shore, and you say, oh man, I got, I got $100,000 sent to me by a friend, and somebody said, oh, oh, you didn't expect it? No, oh, yikes. Nobody would do that. So why do we respond the news of a child that you weren't expecting like that. They're a blessing. I mean, they're a blessing. You wouldn't go, oh, unexpected blessing. Oh, I really like to expect my blessings. Uh, God, I know somebody wanted to give me a car. I wasn't expecting it. Just let me just have it. No, I wasn't ready for it. We would never do that. We'd say, thank you, Lord. Hey, that's an unexpected blessing. And it do you some good parents to stop calling your kids accidents and just call them an unexpected blessing. I feel better now, all right? And so, uh, and so it says children are heirs of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. In other words, God is being kind and he is blessing when he gives a child. He says that that's a blessing from the Lord. Now read verse number four. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Did you know that God likens children to arrows? So this morning when he said, I don't know if I'd want to have children in a world like this, I said, you know, the truth is, do you know what a world like this needs? It needs good, godly children who have been raised and have been taught. I, I honestly do not weep for the world that my children are going to go into I am rejoicing that in a world where up is down and down is up and wrong is right and right is wrong, I can't control what they do when they leave the house. 
But as long as they're in the house, they're going to hear and know what God said is true and what God says is right is right. And this is the way that he says we should go and we're going to walk in it. And from a youth, they're going to learn to love the Lord and fear the Lord and serve the Lord and honor his word. And they're going to know that there is nothing in this world greater than living for the Lord. And there's only one life and it'll soon be passed, but only what's done for Christ will last. I mean, they get to learn those things now in a world that has forgotten them and moved past them. It's one of the greatest gifts that we have. They're like arrows in the hand of a mighty man, is what the Bible says. It's that tool that God gives us that enables us to do far more than we could ever do. Now think back to this. In Bible times, if you were going to go hunt dangerous prey like a bear, you wouldn't do that hand to hand. But you put arrows in the hand of a mighty man, and he could do things that he couldn't do with his bare hands. And the Bible says that's what children are like. They're like arrows in the hands of a mighty man. So are children of the youth. And then I read this verse, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. And I had to realize my whole attitude was, oh boy, oh boy, when the time comes, I have to lug all these kids around. That was my my notion uh, before I got married, before I got married. Not anymore. Not anymore. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of him. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. This is one of the things that God has given. It's one of the purposes of the family to raise up a godly seed. This is why it exists, why marriage exists. This is why God gives parents the job they have. In fact, look with me at several verses of Scripture. Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 19. Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 19. Genesis 18 and verse number 19. I'll start reading in Genesis 18, verse 17, while you turn. If you can't find the book of Genesis, it's the first book. So open to the very beginning, and you should find it pretty quick. Genesis 18, verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, watch this, that he will command his children and his household after him, and that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Did you know one of the great compliments that was said about Abraham is that he said, I know he's going to raise his children to do right. It's pretty incredible. He said it's not just that he's going to do right, but he's going to raise his children to do right. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse number 9. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Moses is going to give a challenge here to the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse number 9. He says, Only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently. So again, the command's first to you, take heed to yourself, keep your soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thine heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. He says, you take and you keep your heart right, you take heed to yourself, and once you've got it right, you teach it to your sons and you teach it to your grandsons. God's interest is generational. Most of the time, people's interest is in their immediate self. God's view is to the second and the third generation. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 7. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 7. I'll start in verse 6. He says, In these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full. He basically gives them the warning, beware 
that you don't forget the Lord in verse number 13, but he says the whole time that God is being good to you and he's leading you, you make sure you're teaching him to your children. You make sure you're talking about it when you get home. You make sure you're talking about it when you rise up. You make sure you write it on the post of your house. You make sure you keep it with you because God did not want that which they had to die with them. It was supposed to continue on to the next generation because the children that God gives to us are like arrows and it's so important while they're young to incline them in the right direction. It's so important while they're young. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know what the Bible says? We have a responsibility to raise up our children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now think about this. We are to raise up our children in the nurture of the Lord and in the admonition of the Lord. You say, well, I thought when I'm teaching my children, I'm teaching them to really obey me, not to obey God. How you raise your children is essentially teaching them how they should interact with the Lord. Think about this. He is our heavenly Father. And so when, uh, when our children were still young, we, we sat down, my wife and I, and we talked about it. We, didn't want ha- we did not want children who would rebel against God. Still don't. Um, that would be one of the, any parent that's experienced it knows it's such a heartbreak. It's such a heartbreak. Oh, it's an awful heartbreak. We didn't want our children to rebel against God. And, and ultimately, just like me, I, I was raised in a good Christian home. I've got a lot to be thankful for. But, but it did not guarantee that I would do right. It just helped me. Help me immensely to do right. I could still choose to do wrong. I could still still choose to uh, fulfill my own fleshly desires and turn my back on the Lord, but it'd be going against the things that I was raised and taught. And so, and so we didn't want our children to rebel against God. We didn't want them to do that. And so because of that, I wanted to teach them, ready, to not rebel against us. I didn't want them to lie Because the Bible says that lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are to his delight. And so we talked about it. When they lie, the consequences fall. Spanking time. Why is that? Because it's really easy to deceive your own heart. And until you're willing to be honest with your own heart and honest with your own sin, you're never going to even have repentance in your life. What you're doing as you're teaching your children is you're raising them in the nurture of the Lord and the admonition of the Lord. And I wanted to teach my children when they were young, look, it's not cute to lie. And sometimes if you're not careful because your kids get cute at lying, you think it's okay. Did you eat your food? No. There's no more cookies left. Did you eat them? No, batting those big, pretty eyes at you. Oh, what am I going to do? You're going to give them a spanking. They're eating something they're not supposed to eat. I mean, you're going you're gonna to correct them, and you're going to encourage them, however you, you, know, you want to do that. Um, you raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I mean, I've seen children think that it's cute to disobey and, and essentially get taught that they can flaunt their parents and disrespect them if they can make people laugh when they do it. As a parent, look, you're raising arrows. I've seen the selection for river cane when they're trying to find cane to make arrows, and they want straight arrows. If the arrow gets bent, then the arrow doesn't fly straight. And we want to raise kids that are straight. In every capacity, okay? 
like all the way, right? We want straight kids. Can I get an amen there, all right? I mean, we want straight kids. We want them to be raised straight-laced. We want them to be eyes on the Lord, looking to God, not veering to the right, not veering to the left. We want to raise children who know what is true and what is right. And here it can breed and turn into Obadiahs, people who grow up in a wicked place, but who know how to shine like a bright light and make a difference in the place that they live. 2 Timothy 3.15, one more verse. It'll be our last one, 2 Timothy 3.15, and then we'll close. I'm not saying that my conclusion is short, I'm just saying we'll close. 2 Timothy 3.15, as Paul writes to Timothy, he says this, 2 Timothy 3, verse number 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And he was pointing back to the fact that Timothy was the earliest church kid you could ever have. Timothy's mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice, uh, there, there is some belief among scholars that when the Last Supper was eaten, Jesus was eating with his disciples, that it was actually in his mom and grandmother's house. This This is the first person who, from a child, got to observe the infancy of the church, and he was the first church kid we have in the Bible, Timothy. He grew up from a child, knowing the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make him wise unto salvation. And Timothy was mightily used by the Lord, and he went back to it. He said, you got raised in this. You were taught this from the beginning. Now, there are many adults that I'm very thankful for the impact they had besides just my parents. Don't think you say, well, my kids are grown or I don't have kids, so this message isn't for me. It is. If a child can see you, you're teaching them. If a child can see you, you're teaching them. I remember learning I remember learning from Mr. Carver, uh, I I learned how to build a bus route. My dad drove the bus and was uh, very faithful to drive the bus, but the captains usually would go out on Saturdays, and I don't think that he did that. He would go out soul winning usually on Tuesday night or Thursday night. And so I learned from Mr. Carver how to to get kids to come to church. He, he, He taught me to walk around. He said, you know, you can go door knocking if you want, or you just look around for signs of kids. Because where there are kids, there are signs of kids. Like bikes in the front yard, swing sets in the backyard, a mess in general. I mean, you just look. you find Little swimming pools. You can usually, if you think about it, find signs of kids. And so he said, look for signs of kids and go ask those kids, hey, you want to come to church? And it's a little different time. You need to talk to parents a little quicker now than you did then. Uh, now when you find children, that's probably the first question. Hey, are your parents around so I can talk to them? If I see a bunch of random people talking to my kids, I'm going to be a little, who's this? What's going on? Most adults are, especially now. Uh, and, uh, but he taught me to do that and, and taught me how to go and visit them and, and to follow up every week and to, and to love the kids when they came. And he taught me how to sing the songs on the bus and all the rest of it. And I'm thankful that even as a young person, I was able to learn some of those things from some adults that taught me and poured into my life. They taught me things from a youth. I'm glad for of the people who preached and the people who served and the people who sang and the people who by their lives taught faithfulness and they were examples of it. I'm just saying that he says, I learned this since I was a youth. I feared the Lord since I was a child. And he says, I still fear the Lord. And when he said, as God lives, I'll be here. He said, well, I know God's alive, so I know you'll be here. And he turned around and he left on the word of the Lord. As a parent, just know this. Your children, and especially your children, but children in general, they're actually pretty good at seeing past the facade. I mean, they really are. They really are. I I went to church with some kids who their parents made them come to church just as much as my parents made me come to church. But I didn't see what was going on at home, and they did. I, I had some friends who their dad beat them and beat their mom awful situation. I I looked at their dad and just thought, you know, you don't want to get on the wrong side of him, and they knew you don't want to get on the wrong side of him. Uh, 
I, I went to church with some people who, who their parents were in church, just like my parents were in church. But when they got home, all their parents did was complain and criticize and find fault. And, and, and those children grew up hearing that. And I'm telling you, it affected them. A lot of them, just because they were brought up in church, didn't want to stay in church. Because their parents didn't really have anything to give them. You remember what he says back in Deuteronomy? He says, first take heed to yourself. Make sure that you're doing right, that you keep it, and then teach it to your children. I'm saying you can't pass on to somebody something you don't have. And so if we have an incredible opportunity, which we do, our church is full of kids. It's full of kids. I love that about our church. Look, where no oxen are, the crib is clean, right? You know, no children, everything stays nice and clean, and it's all where it's supposed to be. Someday my children are going to move out of the house, and I'll have all clean dishes. I'm working on getting to that before they leave the house. Cracking down again. No more putting up with dirty dishes. Amen. I, so look, I, I don't want any of my children to go and someday marry a spouse, and that's what they have to give to their spouse. Dirty dishes? I will have failed you. I can't accept it any longer. I've stayed idle far too long. It's war is being declared now on the dishes. It's gonna, we're going to win it, all right? Uh, where was I going? Somewhere important here. <laughs> Oh, somewhere important. Oh, yeah, with kids, they, they make a mess. That's right, they, they make a mess. Um, and, and look, while the kids, the kids are around, they're sometimes hard. We've got, I can point to the different stains in our church, and almost all of them were from kids. Some of them weren't. Don't be bringing things that aren't water into church, guys. We're going to eventually replace this carpet in the nursery, but don't bring anything but water or milk in there. I said this from the beginning, and nobody feared it. Now I'm going to put it in bold, and we're going to put surveillance cameras or something. I'm going to find out who's drinking coffee and spilling it, and who's giving their kids fruit punch or bug juice or whatever ungodly liquids get stained all over the nursery floor. But anyway, I, I digress. I I'm saying there's going to be marks and evidence. So for whatever, we've got these cool white rocks. Kids love to pick up those white rocks, and I forget how many of them have thrown them out our glass doors. Now, if your kids do that, correct them. All right, but we're going we're gonna to realize you have kids. You, you have kids around. That's how it goes. To an extent, right? You know, I don't want the same kid throwing rocks every week. Teach them, right? Amen, right? Well, look, I don't want to tell you all the things my kids did. It's embarrassing. But hopefully they don't keep doing them. All right? Amen. Yeah, like I said, I won't tell them to you. It's embarrassing, especially embarrassing for them. And I won't tell you about them uh, right now. Maybe another message. We'll see how the kids do. See if they get the dishes clean or not. And, and, um, but we've got kids, and they do crazy things. And, you know, all that can be a frustration, or you can rejoice in it. You can rejoice in it that you've got children who don't even know how to form words that are learning. They go to church. We go to church. When it's Sunday, it's church go to meeting day. When it's Wednesday, it's time to go to church. They, they don't even know all. They're going to grow up knowing songs they don't even remember learning. I, I can't remember the first time I heard at Calvary. As long as I can remember, I just grew up knowing it. I just remember it. We just sang it as a kid all the time, those great hymns of the faith. I just grew up learning them. And we have a chance to impact the next generation, and we can't shirk from it. It is a responsibility from God. As the twig is bent, so the trees inclined. You meet this incredible servant of the Lord. He shows up in Scripture for this brief time, and he gets asked to do a pretty big thing. He doesn't get asked to bring Elijah. He gets asked to bring the king to Elijah. And he's willing to put his life in the hands of God and to trust the Lord because he was from a, from a youth. He had been taught to fear the Lord. He says, this is the word of God. I can trust the word of God. And since he had learned to trust the word of God as a child, he could trust it as an adult. I'm saying while he had some hesitation, he had an incredible history. And there is going to come a point in time where there's going to come a temptation in the life of some of our young people and the teenagers 
And they're going to get tempted to do something they shouldn't do. Because, look, all of us are human, right? I think everybody here knows that. All of us are human. We're all tempted. We all have times where we get tempted to do something we shouldn't do. But what a joy it is when in that moment of temptation, the loudest voice is the voice of what you have been raised and taught, saying, this is true, don't do it, say no. At the end of this road is heartbreak. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not, my son, when sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Uh, when they say, come, let us lay wait and let us lure privily for blood for the innocent without cause. Turn aside, go not with them. You want those voices calling in their heart and in their mind. So let's do our part to send a clear message to any who are listening that what God has said is true and what God has said is right and that his way is best. And the time will come when we'll raise up some Obadiahs too. And in the dark, dangerous, decrepit world, we'll send some arrows that can do some incredible things. Some children who know what's true, or, or some young people who as children knew what was true and learned what was right. And we get a wonderful opportunity to help them along the way. Would you bow your heads for prayer?